Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to the uh, fourth in a series of talks on the McCarthy era and the scientific community. Uh, I have a couple things I want to say before we get on with today's talk, and that is that uh, I have only, it's been very difficult for me to get a hold of these films, so I have only a very short time in which I can show them, and that'll be tomorrow and Wednesday. What I'm talking about are the two Edward R. Murrow See It Now films. These uh, consist of one See It Now that was done by Edward R. Murrow, in which he attempted to uh, do a job in uh, Senator McCarthy by showing simply, essentially, contradictory statements that McCarthy had made at different points in his career. And the second See It Now show uh, is McCarthy's response to Edward R. Murrow. And uh, if anything, this is even more damning than Edward R. Murrow's considered damning of uh, McCarthy. It's really, it's, it's an amazing show, and I would recommend, if you can possibly do it, to come tomorrow and see that. The uh, film on uh, Wednesday, same time, same place, uh, is Point of Order, which is, I suppose, mo most of you have seen, or many of you might have seen, but it's worth seeing again, and that's film centered on the uh, Army McCarthy hearings, uh, which were, uh, in a sense, the downfall of, of McCarthy. Uh, so actually, you'll see, in various ways, the last two sessions and three films, McCarthy doing a job on himself. Yeah. I don't think so. I don't. I haven't made any provisions for it. Uh, as a point of information, point of order, I got gotten that out of uh, the Boston Public Library, and since I had to go through the process of getting the library card renewed, then you can get it out now too. So, if you want to see that in your own. All right. Uh, the speaker today is Dr. Louis Menand, who. Uh, aside from being a generally good person and very active here in the MIT community, is especially well qualified to uh, present kind of an overview on the interaction of the McCarthy era and the scientific community. Up to now, we've had three people talking who are, uh, in a sense, participants, and uh, it's been very valuable and, and interesting to see their close-up, first-hand report. But uh, I think it's nice to have these things put in perspective, which Dr. Manand will, will be doing today. He is, uh, as a political scientist, he's followed closely the development of civil liberties in this country, and in fact his doctoral work was on the American concept of loyalty, and he teaches uh, a course on constitutional law here at MIT, and so with these qualifications he's especially well suited to, uh, to talk today on the subject. Dr. Manan? Thank you, Ted, very much. I really appreciate the opportunity that Ted has given, I think, all of us to participate in this series on McCarthy and the scientific community. When this idea first came up back in the fall, uh, several of us were very anxious to endorse it, particularly at a time now some 20 years after McCarthy's own political demise, and also at a time when we were about to celebrate the American bicentennial and call to mind some of the civil liberties principles that underlie the American system. Before getting into the details of what I would like to talk about today, I would like to pass out for your use a bibliography, uh, which I've put together, which purports to be, and is, a very casual bibliography. It's not systematic in any real sense, uh, but let me pass it out, and I might make a few comments about it before proceeding a, a little uh, further. As you know, we've had some presentations, the pr three preceding presentations uh, were made by uh, two members of the MIT faculty and one member of the Harvard faculty. Uh, Professor Gerald Zacharias talked uh, about his relationships with the Oppenheimer uh, case as it developed uh, in uh, 1953 and in 1954. Professor Hill spoke about the relationships between the McCarthy investigations and uh, MIT directly, and got into questions of the loyalty security program of the federal government. 
And Professor Ramsey last week talked about what it was like to be a physicist and a friend of a colleague who himself was under attack and the kinds of legal and political issues involved in trying to deal with that kind of a situation. The purpose of putting this bibliography together on my part was merely to list some of the general secondary sources that are available here at MIT uh, for you to use in pursuing any aspect of American civil liberties or the McCarthy, Alger, Hiss, Oppenheimer, Nixon events of the period sort of 1945 uh, to date. I've broken this out into six general sections uh, for ready reference. The books on McCarthy are uh, fairly obvious, and let me make an observation about one of these. Well, really two. The first is what I think is the best book about McCarthy and the purposes of McCarthy and his methods and procedures, and this is Richard Revere's extraordinary volume called Senator Joe McCarthy, the first one on the list here. Uh, it's in paperback, and I really commend it to you. It's an extraordinarily well-written book by a man who has been for many years now the Washington correspondent for the New Yorker magazine. Uh, Dick has done other books uh, in conjunction with uh, Arthur Schlesinger, did a marvelous book on uh, McCarthy and Truman, and that book itself now forms the basis for a, I think, a television thing that was just done. The title of the book was called The President and the General. And the other book I would mention on here is a book that I mentioned, uh, of my person, I mentioned when Professor Hill was speaking, Owen Lattimore. Owen Lattimore was a political scientist at Johns Hopkins University as one of the first American intellectuals singled out by Joe McCarthy uh, for, uh, with his charge that Owen Lattimore was a dupe of the communists and was a powerful figure directing American foreign policy in the State Department, uh, none of which was true, of course. And uh, Lattimore then wrote this book called Ordeal by Slander. The material on Oppenheimer is fairly self-evident. Uh, there was a minor industry that was developed out of the Oppenheimer uh, case, uh, and some of these people were some of the individual investors in that minor set of uh, industrial activities. Uh, and I understand that uh, uh, Professor Charles Weiner on this faculty is producing a, an additional book on Oppenheimer, perhaps Oppenheimer uh, retrospectively some years later. Uh, I put the books on the loyalty security program on here. Because these are the first two, by Eleanor Bontecu and Walter Gelhorn, are two very serious, detailed studies of the executive order issued by Harry Truman and the second one issued by Dwight Eisenhower, dealing with the Federal Loyalty Security Program. Those of you who heard Professor Hill will recall that he talked about the problems of people who were working for defense installations and the provisions under which they could be hired and not hired, the standards used to determine whether they were, quote, loyal or, quote, security risks. And those standards and so forth are set forth in two major executive orders. Those form the basis of the study by both Montague and Gellhorn. They're, as you can see now, 20 years or more old, but they still, I think, are the best uh, analyses of that kind of uh, uh, executive department uh, order, and we can come back to that somewhat later. Uh, the books on the CIA and the FBI are, are quite obvious. Uh, I put on uh, the third book on this because the second book on this list forms the basis for one of uh, Rex Stout's Nero Wolf mysteries, and in fact, in uh, the doorbell rang. Uh, Rex Stout, uh, through the person of his great detective, Nero Wolf, does a marvelous hatchet job on J. Edgar Hoover, in case you're interested in hatchet jobs on J. Edgar Hoover. I don't have any books on this list which are favorable to the FBI, and I think you ought to be aware of that. Uh, the books on Alger Hiss, that was another minor industry which got started. Uh, the individual entrepreneur who invested heavily in that industry was Nixon, and therefore I've included his book, Six Crises. One of his crises was Alger Hiss. Uh, 
uh, or he, or Nixon was one of Alfred Hitler's crises. I don't know which one it was. At any rate, uh, you can look these up. The last book on that uh, one with Alger Hiss is done by uh, uh, Earl Jowett. Earl Jowett had been the Chief Justice in England and was fascinated with this American case and did a thorough study uh, looking at the case of Alger Hiss and the actual law case in terms of British principles of justice, British uh, uh, forms of evidence, and so on. And finally, the last section uh, is just a potpourri of things that I happen to have around, which I thought would be helpful in looking at uh, various aspects of President, Congress, Court, and so on. There are two notes that I would make about this. In the middle, uh, there are two uh, references, one to the Columbia Law Review and the second to the Harvard Law Review. And those are contemporary sources in which you can sort of find out now what the law is relative to individual rights and individual liberties in the areas of, quote, national security. And I put those on the, there as rather contemporary articles dealing with uh, these significant issues. Uh, there is one typo on here, which I noticed, and my arm isn't quite long enough to see it. Oh, yes. It's the third from the last on the list. It's Richard Hofstadter's and Walter Metzger's extraordinarily good study, and very important in terms of the relationship of McCarthy and all these other events to the academic community. This, the title should be The Development of Academic Freedom in the U.S., the development of academic freedom in the United States. And those of you who are interested in the issue of academic freedom and the historical part of it, I think, uh, will find that helpful. It's quite obvious from this list uh, that there is much more I could have added. As I said, this purports to be and is, I think, a very casual list. But most of these materials are available at the end in the MIT libraries in case you wish to pursue it. The title of this series is The McCarthy Era and the Scientific Community. And it's quite clearly uh, obvious to all of us that the scientific community and its members became the subject of great concern in this country after the Second World War. I don't want to rehash the developments that Professors uh, Zacharias, Hill, and Ramsey went through in terms of the role that physicists began to play as a function of their work during the Second World War and on the atom bomb. I might make an observation or so coming from a social scientist and a citizen as against my fellow citizens and scientists, or not as against them, but concerning them. But it seemed to me that the physics community, as it emerged in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, and certainly down to the end of the Second World War, was very much an international community. And as an international community, had broad international contact contacts. The physicists communicated one with another across national boundaries. And in a sense, I suppose, without really thinking about it, were internationalists. Many of them, as you know, had come to this country in the 30s fleeing fascist, fascism in Italy or fascism in Germany. Others were still, of the great world physicists, were still living in Northern Europe. Having grown up in Europe in the 20s and early 30s, many of the physicists and other scientists had, of course, developed strong relationships on a great variety of subjects with a great variety of people. I suppose people one could classify as communists, fascists, vegetarians, pacifists, you name it. Hence, the kind of physics community that was highly visible in 1946, 48, 50 in this country reflected that strong international quality. Therefore, I think that the physicists and the mathematicians in particular uh, were the object of considerable interest, both by the part of those like McCarthy and others who were concerned about American, quote, security, and by others who were interested in protecting the vitality and the integrity of the scientific effort and protecting the vitality and integrity of the academic effort in which they were all functioning. My role in this series, therefore, is as a non-physicist, talking as a political scientist who has spent most of his professional life looking closely at American civil liberties. In the opening series of this series, Professor Zacharias noted this list of names on the right side of the board up here, 
And he came to my name and he said, I don't know where Menand was during that period. And that was a fair observation, and I think you ought to know uh, where I was and what I was doing. Uh, and let me just, I don't intend this to be a biographical presentation in any sense, but I want to just make sure you understand where I was. After having served in the Navy in the Second World War, I was in graduate school from 46 to 48, and then started on a rather circuitous academic career, which ended me up uh, during 50 and 51 working in the executive office under Harry Truman. And though the loyalty security area in the Truman administration was not my direct beat, I was indirectly involved in some of the activities at that time. I might say that uh, by that time, President Truman's loyalty order, which had gone into effect in 1947, was having a very serious effect on a lot of my friends, and quite uh, outside of my normal professional life in Washington, spent a good deal of time counseling colleagues who had been caught in the gears of the loyalty security program and had lost their jobs. Uh, that was the kind of personal experience that a great many of us went through. Uh, one anecdote about that period, I had been teaching in 1949 and took a group of students to Washington and, among other things, toured a variety of offices meeting with sort of undersecretary types, and we spent a morning at the State Department, and it was just after Senator McCarthy had leveled his charges against Owen Lattimore, and the question came up with the, I guess he was Assistant Secretary, as to, in fact, uh, how this was, what effect this was having on the State Department. And the man said, well, I'm spending my entire time responding to these allegations of McCarthy. Of course, it's not true at all. Owen Lattimore is not an employee of the State Department, never has been an employee of the State Department. And he went on some length about this. That afternoon, the students were in the gallery of the United States Senate, and Senator McCarthy rose once again to make his allegations against uh, Owen Lattimore as being a dupe and so on and so on. And I had all I could do to refrain from, restrain these students from jumping down or yelling and saying, that's not true, we've been to the State Department, and that's not true, Senator McCarthy, we know it. Terrible. The point was that they were able to see both sides of this in one day, the administration reaction and the McCarthy charges. I, from 1952 to 1956, was teaching at Dartmouth, and during that period, uh, was concerned with a group, many aspects of what became known as the McCarthyism problem. Uh, two, I think, are worth mentioning in this context. A number of us have been some, some co so concerned about the political atmosphere in the United States Senate, uh, to which I will return, that I uh, went to call on several times Senator Herbert Lehman. Senator Lehman was the senior senator, senator from New York State, and a man of immense prestige in this country and a man of impeccable liberal uh, credentials, and a man of great personal security, and who couldn't possibly be concerned about anything McCarthy might say or do to him, around him, or about him. And in talking over the general issue of McCarthy's political role in the Senate, I asked Senator Lehman several times as to whether he wouldn't be willing to try to get some senators to mount some kind of a counterattack about McCarthy and what McCarthy was doing in the Senate at that time. And Herbert Lehman said that there was nothing that he could do, and that he thought that the thing was so politically powerful that even he, from his vantage point, could not undertake any particular activities in order to curtail McCarthy's uh, power or the role that he was trying to fulfill. I must say that was rather a dispiriting uh, uh, session, set of sessions with Senator Lehman. The other thing that is worth mentioning is that as a member of the Dartmouth College faculty uh, and as a citizen, I spent a good deal of time charging around the state of New Hampshire, which at that time was uh, also under the uh, benign leadership of the then Attorney General of New Hampshire, a man whose name you may know. His name was at the, the, then and still is uh, Louis Wyman. You may recall that Louis Wyman was the subject of the Durkin-Wyman non-election in uh, New Hampshire uh, of 18 months ago.
Wyman, as Attorney General of New Hampshire, was investigating the Dartmouth College faculty and anybody else for evidences of disloyalty, communist relations, and so on. Those of us who were going after not only Louis Wyman, but Senator McCarthy, had the misfortune at times to be picked up by the major newspaper in New Hampshire. It's called the New Ham Manchester Union Leader. <laughs> and uh, I happen to have here a little list. Uh, it's a book, which is, uh, perhaps you know, it's uh, Who the Hell is William Loeb? Well, William Loeb is the editor of the Manchester Union Leader. And I've had the happy fortune of being figured in several of his editorials and articles then. And then in 1960, when I was dean of a girls' college here in Massachusetts, I invited a very liberal, very highly respected, but nonetheless very liberal, professor of political science from Williams College to come to speak. His name was Frederick Schumann. Schumann uh, had, uh, in the early 50s, been quite, cons uh, had uh, caused a good deal of, I guess, trepidation among Williams alumni who were being asked to give to Williams College. And the then president of Williams, Finney Baxter, told the alumni he would keep Schumann, they could keep their money. It was the price of giving was uh, that Schumann go. Very courageous act to have taken back then. At any rate, I invited Schumann to speak, and William Loeb uh, ran a series of articles wanting to know why I invited uh, Schumann to speak, and why in introducing Schumann, I had not mentioned the fact that Schumann's name was many times in the uh, files of the House Committee on Un-American Activities. This was went on for about a week, and during the course of this, on front page editorials, I was referred to as the good red dean. <laughs> uh, subsequent to uh, that period, uh, I uh, have continued teaching in constitutional law and in civil liberties, and uh, have been following the more recent activities of the last uh, eight or ten years with as equal concern as during the earlier period. I think there is a tendency in this country to look at the McCarthy, McCarthyism and Joe McCarthy as a kind of aberration, an aberration which we somehow tended to live through in the period from 1948 until his censorship being censored by the U.S. Senate in 1954. McCarthy clearly was a very powerful demagogue, but I think it's a mistake to think that he is that much of an aberration in American life. American history, particularly since the 1880s, is filled with examples of people like McCarthy or movements like McCarthyism, which have surfaced at various times. In the period immediately after the turn of the century, when the international workers of the world were very active in this country and when the labor movement was still trying to gain some kind of legal foothold, there were those who were very anxious to suppress labor and were claiming that, of course, the Wobblies, as they were known, and others affiliated with the labor movement were, in a sense, agents of international anarchism or communism. Of course, the Russian Revolution hadn't occurred then. And at the turn of the century, there was, in the individual states in this country, legislation dealing with the issue of what came to be called criminal syndicalism, that is, uh, inflammatory uh, activities or particularly talk on the part of individuals who were anxious to change the character of American society. During World War I, there were two major pieces of legislation passed which tended to deal with the problems of uh, seditious speech and issues of espionage. The Sedition Act and the Espionage Act both passed in 1917. Right after the end of the First World War, uh, the, the whole question of socialism and communism again surfaced very actively. And uh, it was the time of the so-called A. Mitchell Palmer raids. A. Mitchell Palmer was the Attorney General under Woodrow Wilson, in Wilson's last days in the White House. And Palmer, uh, on January 1st, 1921, proceeded to round up hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of aliens as well as citizens, allegedly who were socialists, and put them in prison under very vague uh, ju justification and authority. Uh, at the same time, in 1921, uh, socialists who had been elected to the New York State Assembly 
were denied their seat in the New York State Assembly just because they were socialists, not because they had been convicted of any crime, but because of the political stances that they took. In the early 30s, uh, there was a wave of concern about the question of communists and socialists in uh, educational institutions, particularly in the public educational institutions around the country. Many, many states in the period from 1931 to about 1934 act enacted laws uh, which required either oath oaths of allegiance on the part of teachers or loyalty oaths on the part of teachers or set up many investigations looking into alleged subversion among teachers uh, who were, were supposedly uh, uh, communists and socialists. At one time I did a interesting, what well, to me turned out to be an interesting little study. If you take World War I, and I'll come to World War II in a moment, there was very little in the way of state legislation or federal legislation which attempted to get at the problems of espionage and sabotage or try to control commies or fascists or anarchists or whatever. But in the period when we were not at war, allegedly at peace, for example, in the early years of the 1920s, and again in the early years of the 1930s, perhaps when state legislatures didn't have anything else to do, they passed many, many pieces of legislation dealing with the problem of loyalty oaths and investigations and so on. Again, of course, this all surfaced uh, not during World War II, but in the years after World War II. But that may be an exception because we were in what came to be known, of course, as the Cold War. In 1940, Congress passed what came to be known as the Smith Act. And the Smith Act was the major piece of legislation which was used in 1948-49-50 to indict the leaders of the American Communist Party, not for attempting to overthrow the United States government by force and violence, but for organizing and conspiring to organize to teach and advocate the desirability of the overthrow of the U.S. government. This became a major Supreme Court case in 1951. And you look at the date here, this occurred at a time when, of course, the Hiss case and when Senator McCarthy himself uh, were coming to the fore. But the Smith Act was passed in 1940 as a part of the Alien Registration Act. My point in mentioning these historical points along the way is to indicate that in America, there has been, for a long period of time, concern with people who are, who are using language and expressing ideas which seem to have some kind of disloyalty or absence of allegiance associated with them. And we see this in our own time. Now the relationship of the individual in society to the tribal myths that keep the society going and the relationship of the individual in society to constituted authority is a theme that continually runs through all kinds of political history, from Antigone to date. And the genius of democracy, presumably, is to try to find some way in which, rationally, one sorts out the things that one should do as an inalienable right, and be protected in doing as an inalienable right, and at the same time rationally sort out those things which the society should do to, quote, protect itself. A, series of activities that we're still engaged in. Our immediate focus in the McCarthy era, I suppose, can be dated not from the Smith Act of 1940, but from the period immediately after the Second World War, as has been so well stated here in the three preceding sessions. But there are some things that I would like to fill in for you as we move sort of from 1946 forward into the middle and late 1950s is part of this extraordinary period. I don't have to recite for you that which has already, already been as, uh, recited, the developments of the Cold War, the kinds of strains that put on American military power, American political power, both at home and abroad, and the kinds of strains that brought domestically within the society. I think the beginning point is to look at the election, congressional election of 1946, you will recall that the last time the Republicans controlled the Congress prior to 1946 was the period from 1928 to 1930. 
1930, the Democrats took over control, and Roosevelt and the Democrats proceeded to dominate American politics for the succeeding 15 years. The election of 1946, therefore, like the British election after the Second World War, was a kind of uh, throw the rascals out. We want some change. The question in this country was whether we were going to get back change back to normalcy, which had occurred in the 1920s, or change into something else. Insofar as American security issues were concerned and civil liberties issues, the election of 1946, to me, crystallized a debate that had been going. It was starting in this country. It had been going on during the Second World War. A major strategic decision had to be taken by Franklin Roosevelt, and that strategic decision was to whether the United States would fight the Pacific War first or the Atlantic War first. And there were those, particularly the great bulk of people in the Midwest in this country, who felt very strongly that we should fight the Pacific War first. But America's great hero in the Pacific, General Douglas MacArthur, deserved to get all the support he could, and that we should fight that war. The Eastern establishment, if I can use that language, of which Roosevelt, I suppose, was the then, was it proper to say father figure? I don't know. At any rate, he represented those interests. Looked across the Atlantic. They had a view on the East, and the Midwest had a view on the West. And they said, we will fight the European war first. And General MacArthur and his troops and so on in the Pacific will have to get along on what they have. This was a major issue between President Truman, uh, President Roosevelt, and then subsequently President Truman, uh, on the one side, and the conservatives, particularly in the Republican Party, on the other. Senator Taft, at first Senator Vandenberg, and others were very disappointed at this decision. And of course, in terms of American support and uh, un unity, they supported it during the Second World War, but reluctantly. Therefore, at the end of the Second World War, there was an enormous thrust to try to redirect American foreign policy uh, toward with a greater preoccupation with China, a greater preoccupation with the Pacific. And that not only was a foreign policy issue, it also tended to be a domestic policy issue. The Midwest and the East tended to have great differences between them on this sub subject. I mention this only to suggest, therefore, that issues of American leadership and its foreign position were important. There was a man who arrived in Washington in the same year on the Senate side, and his name was Joseph McCarthy. And in a sense, you had, therefore, surfacing during the late 40s in both the House and the Senate, Nixon and McCarthy. Let me deal with the Nixon thing first. Nixon was appointed to the House Committee on Un-American Activities. The House Committee on Un-American Activities in early 1947, now under Republican control because the Republicans won the majority in both houses as a result of the 1946 election, began to investigate a variety of activities in this country, and their first uh, major investigation concerned the entertainment industry. And Professor Hill spoke about this uh, uh, a couple of sessions ago, and he said that although the physicists took it on the chin, the people who really took it on the chin were the people in the entertainment world, particularly the Hollywood people, the writers, the producers, some actors. And they had some scalps to hang on the wall, as a result of this, uh, and let me come back to what the scalps looked like in a moment. Uh, somewhere in late 1947, Richard Nixon ran into a person by the name of Whitaker Chambers. And Whitaker Chambers began to talk with Nixon and his staff about his relationships with a variety of people working in the U.S. government back in the 1930s. And one of the persons that he spoke about was a man by the name of Alger Hiss. Alger Hiss was one of those persons who was sort of a model civil servant. I knew Alger Hiss very slightly in 1946 and 47, just before his fall. And if he was anything in the 30s, such as he was in 1946 and 47, he was a mild, reasonably bright uh, administrator. He was then head of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace.
Whitaker Chambers set it up such that he accused Hiss of having given him secret State Department documents in 1930s. When Hiss uh, then was invited to the Nixon on American Activities Committee hearings, he was asked if he'd ever seen Whitaker Chambers. I don't know if you, any of you have ever heard this um, dialogue. It's a marvelous thing. It's on one of those, I can hear it now, records. It's uh, by Edward R. Murrow. And he has uh, Nixon, or one of the committee counsel, saying, now, Mr. Hiss, would you stand up, please? And now, uh, Mr. Chambers, would you stand up, please? And Hiss having denied that he ever heard of Whitaker Chambers. And they said, uh, Mr. Hiss, Mr. Hiss, do you recognize Whitaker Chambers? And Hiss said, well, I recognize him, but not as Whitaker Chambers. I recognize him as George Crosley. And then that started a whole series of things. Was Whitaker, was Alger Hiss telling the truth? And what about all these papers? And what about the mutual relationships between Whitaker Chambers and Hiss and his family in this period and so on and so on? And the whole eventual case rested on the question as to whether Alger Hiss was telling the truth. He was indicted for perjury, uh, convicted for perjury, and served his jail term on the issue of perjury, not on the issue as to whether he'd given away state secrets, uh, which is not a crime, incidentally, uh, yet. Uh, but it was on the question of perjury. Uh, this whole his case took the period from uh, 48 down to 1951, uh, 2, and 3, a whole series of cases of court hearings and so on. At the same time, in 1950, in addition to McCarthy surfacing in spring of 1950 with his famous lists of 47 and 92 and 38 communists working in the State Department, <laughs> Uh, the United States had, was involved deeply in a variety of Cold War activities. The NATO alliance had been formed in 1949, and it was sold to the American Congress and the American people as a major bulwark against international communist aggression. Stalin and his troops would take over all of Europe without NATO. And there was a strong feeling that the Americans must support this anti-communist effort. In addition, by 19, June of 1950, the United States had surfaced as the major military force in South Korea. The North Koreans had invaded South Korea. In 1950, we were in the third year of the activities under the President's Loyalty Security Order where people were uh, investigated as to whether they could, in fact, go to work for the United States government. There was a good deal of what we now call hysteria in this country about communists and about people who read Marxist literature, about Marxist study groups on American campuses, and about Marxist members of faculty, or people who read the New Republic, or people who were married to people whose brothers-in-law, third time removed, had somehow worked in Hungary during the Second World War for communists or something. There was a good deal of this, and this is all documentable. I don't want to give you a whole litany of this, but it's all there. The kinds of guilt by association uh, allegations that were made. So much so that in 1950, Congress passed an act which was called the Internal Security Act. And the sponsor of this, well, on the Senate side, was a man by the name of Senator Pat McCarran. And it became known as the McCarran Internal Security Act. There were 10 members of the United States Senate who voted against this bill. President Truman vetoed the bill in a very interesting veto message. And the Senate passed it over his veto with only seven members voting to sustain the veto. Three had already dropped by the wayside. The issue of communist infiltration and concern was very, very deep in 1950. What did the, McCar what did the Internal Security Act provide, the so-called McCarran Act? Well, among other things, it did the following. It set up something called the Subversive Activities Control Board. And the Subversive Activities Control Board was to hold hearings, and after the hearings, decide whether any organization was a communist action or communist front organization. It took the Subversive Activities Control Board 14 months to have hearings and decide that the Communist Party was, in fact, a communist action group. 
The same Richard Rovere who wrote the book about Joe McCarthy once did an extrapolation on this, saying at this rate, uh, he, he, he even figured out it would take, you know, until 2010 to work through any decent list of organizations and so on. The second thing the McCarra Internal Security Act did was to provide for detention of Americans. Under the provisions of this bill, which was, became a law, if the president declared a national emergency, any person, citizen or non-citizen, could be detained by the U.S. government. Detained meant being sent to a detention camp. And under the administration of this act, once it got passed, there were five detention camps set up in this country. Two were the camps that were used to house the Japanese Americans during the Second World War. One was in Allentown or Indian Town Gap or someplace in your home state of Pennsylvania, Indian Town Gap. I've forgotten where the other two were. Vietnamese there. Maybe some Vietnamese enjoying the bounty of uh, <laughs> Senator McCarthy's camps. These used to be called concentration camps during the Second World War. They were called detention camps under the McCarran Act. Uh, in fairness to history or Congress, I must say that that provision of the bill has now been st st struck from the record, and the detention camps no longer exist. And what happened to you if you were got picked up off the street and detained and sent to a detention camp? Well, you could request a review of your case, whatever the case might be, and they didn't have to tell you what the evidence was under the provisions of the legislation. You could ask to be, have a hearing before the Detention Review Board. And if the Detention Review Board reviewed you in a way which you found unsatisfactory, you then could appeal your case to a U.S. Court of Appeals. In the meantime, remaining in the detention camp, habeas corpus procedures were not available. The third thing that the McCarran Act did, among others, was to provide that any person who was found to belong to an organization on a list of organizations created by the U.S. Attorney General could not work in defense industries just by mere virtue of having been a member of an organization. Professor Hill referred to this the other day, and someone asked a question about this loyalty security business and the organizations and so on. We can come back to that if you care to. Where we stand now is that the Subversive Activities Control Board, incidentally, for years, I wanted to get on the Subversive Activities Control Board. I thought it was the finest sinecure that was alive in Washington. It paid a salary of $35,000, and they never met. <laughs> and I thought it was a great thing. Uh, and no, I tried to get some students who were, had Republican friends to get me to put on it, but they, they couldn't. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court has ruled as being unconstitutional, this, prov this question of not being able to work in defense-related things, merely for membership uh, in an organization that's on the Attorney General's list. Uh, and I told you that the detention review procedures have gone by the boards. There are other and minor and rather irritating provisions of the McCarran Act which are still on the books. Now remember, this was passed in 1950. An additional piece of legislation was passed in 1952. This was called, again, the McCarran Act, although it was co-authored by uh, Congressman Walter, uh, again from the state of Pennsylvania, uh, in the House, the McCarran-Walter Act. And this was an immigration bill, an immigration bill which set up very high barriers uh, for aliens seeking to come into this country either as immigrants or on temporary visas. And even at this institution, we have friends in Europe who try to come here to lecture who are Marxists and who had been associated with the Marxist party or who knew friends who were associated. Somehow the local embassy in Europe uh, will not grant them a visa. Matter of fact, I was just trying to intervene on behalf of one of these citizens last month. Europeans invited to this country to give a paper, unable to get a visa. That provision still exists on the statute books. Those of you who travel internationally, incidentally, will know that the United States is one of the few, if not the only country, which requires people to prov provide their fingerprints in order to get a visa to come in this country. 
And this is a provision of the McCarran-Walter Immigration Act. That kind of thing still is on the statute books. In 1952, we had a major presidential election. And the question was, how would the presidential vote in that year affect the growing concern about commies under every bed, the whole issue of hysteria, and so on? The issues were reasonably sharply drawn, although I think they could have been more sharply drawn, as between General Eisenhower running on the Republican ticket and Governor Stevenson running on the Democratic ticket. Those who were concerned about the excesses of McCarthy, Nixon, the whole business, of course, were very strongly supportive of Governor Stevenson. Uh, General Eisenhower's role in this was not clear, like it was not clear on a great many issues. Uh, he had been out of the country in the preceding eight, 18 months as the first director of SHAFE, our NATO activity, and had been living in Europe. And, of course, he had been in the Army his entire life and had never taken out registration provisions to vote prior to the 1952 election. That's a fact. But nonetheless, General Eisenhower came into the election, and he was an unknown quantity. There were those like James Reston of the New York Times, Walter Lippmann, who said, we must have Eisenhower because a Democrat is too sus suspect. We can't clean house of all this kind of thing unless we have a Republican. Furthermore, if we have a Republican, he can bring the Korean War to a close. A Democrat couldn't, because he would be accused of losing Korea or something, the way we're, they were accused of losing China. Uh, General Eisenhower was elected, as you know. The next thing that was heard from General Eisenhower happened to be in the context of a series of McCarthy activities. Vice President Hill, when he spoke here, referred to the visit to MIT of two of Senator McCarthy's uh, young staff people, Roy Cohen and G. David Schein. Among other things, Roy Cohen and G. David Schein, under directions from Senator McCarthy, who was then chairman of his own subcommittee in the Senate, uh, began to make investigations of United States Information Agency libraries, a, a, which had been established overseas. Uh, and uh, these two, what were called gumshoes, uh, descended on uh, European capitals, demanding to be given treatment, but also to investigate what was on the shelves of the libraries. And there were many pictures of them going, uh, uh, cartoons by Herblock and others of them going through and censoring this and throwing things in the bonfires and so on and so on. And this caused a good deal of concern in the academic community, because the academic community said, look, what's the, good, what's the purpose of a library? The purpose of a library is to have all information. It's not to have selected information. And if you want to select the information, forget the library. The senator did not see it this way. In June of 1953, Dwight Eisenhower, then five months in the presidency, was invited to Dartmouth College, where he was going to be given an honorary degree. He was not the commencement speaker, but he was given a degree, and after being given his degree, he made some remarks to the assembled throng of graduates and their grandparents and parents. And he said, among other things, I hope that you do not join the book burners. And everybody said, oh, at last he's beginning to speak out. Finally, he's saying, you know, McCarthy and Cohn and Shy, we must stop this. At noon the following day, back in Washington, his press secretary, James Haggerty, held a press conference in which he said, the president did not say, he did not mean everything people are saying he meant. <laughs> he didn't really mean that. So we were still unsure as to whether, where General Eisenhower was on all these issues. There was a theory afloat, which was, uh, I think, in, a, in retrospect, is a theory which is most dear to those who thought that he had done properly correctly. That was that if you give McCarthy enough, quote, rope, he will hang himself. Now, McCarthy came into the United States Senate for the only other time since 1930 that the Republicans have controlled the Congress. As I said, they controlled the Congress from 46 to 48, and again from 52 to 54. And by virtue of their controlling both houses, Republicans, therefore, were chairman of all House and Senate committees 
McCarthy was not chairman of the parent committee in the Senate, which is the Government Operations Committee. He was chairman of a subcommittee. I think it was a subcommittee on investigations or a permanent subcommittee on investigations, something like that. And it was that committee chairmanship which provided him with the opportunity between 52 or early 53 and down to the Army McCarthy hearings with the opportunity to issue subpoenas, hold hearings, schedule meetings, and to, in fact, run these things like Star Chamber proceedings. Now, let me make a further point about this. To a political scientist, a McCarthy represents, or a Nixon, or a Colby, uh, or a church, or uh, anybody, represent not only the substantive issue with which you're dealing, the question of subversion, the question of loyalty, the question of Watergate, whatever, whatever. But the political scientist and the citizen, those things also represent, or those people also represent, questions of proper of procedures, of the proper legal and political base from which actions are taken. So much of the activity that Congressman Nixon undertook was a function of the Republicans having had majorities in the House from 47 to 49, so much of Senator McCarthy's work was done, either on the floor of the Senate, where, as Vice President Hill said, he was immune, and in fact should be immune, or as a function of his being chairman of a subcommittee. If he loses the chairmanship, he doesn't have the power. This is a very important thing to keep in mind. Uh, how institutions and procedures interact with the particular thing that you're trying to do or see get done. Therefore, it does make a difference, for example, as to what group of people representing what political party, let's say, are in charge in the Senate or in the House at any particular time. This is also true, of course, in the, uh, in the states. The same thing holds true. So that when you're looking at political in, political activities, you have to think of these institutional supports which are there or are not there. Uh, I won't go through the McCarthy thing because that's so well going to be documented in all of this. And we don't have to worry about that. Just to say that G. David Sean was the immediate cause of the Army McCarthy hearings. Uh, a young member of Senator McCarthy's staff. That was in 1954. 1954 was also another year in which the Senate attempted to, I don't know what they were attempting to do, it's very hard to say. Out of it, at any rate, came something called the Communist Control Act, which did not add measurably to our understanding of any particular issue, nor did it add measurably to the Internal Security Act that I summarized for you a few minutes ago. What it was, and why I reflect on it, was an attempt on the part of, quote, Senate liberals, represented by Hubert Humphrey, to say, we too were against communists. And the Communist Control Act of 1954 was essentially an act which was sponsored by Senator Humphrey. I never understood why he sponsored it, and it was an act which, as I said, didn't add materially. It had something to do with further registration of communist parties and so on. Uh, this was in 1954. It was, interestingly enough, it was passed in the same summer that the Senate finally got around to mounting an inquiry into Senator McCarthy in the summer of 19... Did I say 74? Anyway, 54. Since 74 was another summer. Uh, uh, subsequent to uh, the uh, censors of uh, Senator McCarthy in 1954, as you know, he finally uh, expired. Uh, in 1957, uh, from natural causes, uh, or yes, from natural causes. Uh, let me go back for a moment to make some observation about the relationships between Senator McCarthy and General Eisenhower. I mentioned to you that Eisenhower was an unknown quantity and that he said some things about book burning. During the campaign of 1952, and someone has referred to this already in these sessions, Senator, uh, General Eisenhower was campaigning in Wisconsin, and 
he was mindful of the fact that his great mentor, the person who had picked him way down the list of junior officers in the army to become an American commander in North Africa, the man who had done this was the then chief of staff during the Second World War, General George C. Marshall. General Marshall was one of those sort of father figures in the American military, highly admired by many Americans, highly admired by Harry Truman. General Marshall had been asked by Harry Truman after the war at one point to be the Secretary of State and served in that role for a brief period. Among other things, General Marshall attempted in 1947, early 48, to go to China. He went to China, he didn't attempt to, he got there, but he attempted while in China to try to work out some kind of a negotiated settlement between the Chinese nationalists and Mao Zedong, Chinese communists. This did not materialize, as we know, and uh, that brought a retort from Senator McCarthy. And Senator McCarthy, sometime in 1950 or 51, characterized uh, General Marshall as a black, black traitor to his country. And the question in 1952 during the campaign was, what is General Eisenhower going to do about this charge of Senator McCarthy's about uh, General Marshall? And General Eisenhower visited Wisconsin in his campaign swing, and he had a prepared address he was going to give, and I think it was in, uh, might have been Milwaukee, I think it was in Madison, I'm not quite sure anyway, to Wisconsin. And it subsequently turns out, in the afternoon prior to his giving this speech, Senator McCarthy called on General Eisenhower, candidate Eisenhower, in his hotel suite. He went up the back stairs, of the hotel and descended from the back stairs of the hotel. And it's when the speech was given, references to General Marshall had been deleted from the speech. Those references to General Marshall, in which Eisenhower praised him, were reinserted in a speech that was given a week or so later in New Jersey. This was all of these events I'm now telling you were not known directly during the course of the campaign. We did know that General Eisenhower, during the course of the campaign, failed to speak up in McCarthy's presence and directly to McCarthy about his feelings about General Marshall. Now, much of the activity that was undertaken by various House committees and the Senate committees, the House on Activities, uh, American Activities Committee, the House Internal Security uh, Committee, McCarthy's committee, the Senate Internal Security Committee, ended up in a variety of court cases. And those court cases tended to string out over a period of years after the high point of this concern and hysteria, if you will, tended to have uh, abated somewhat. And those court cases do two or three things. They have knocked out certain provisions of the Internal Security Act and they have turned back on some of the uh, contempt charges that were voted by either the House or the Senate because people refused to cooperate in their investigations. They also have markedly strengthened the procedures that the House and the Senate must use now in making any kind of investigations, in subpoenaing people, and in telling people of their rights before the committee. One of the great issues that confronted the individual citizen, the writer, or the Hollywood director, or the physicist, or the mathematician, or Joe Glutt school teacher in Kansas called before some committee. One of the issues that faced that sort of citizen back in 1946, 47, 48, 49, was that the procedures that were used in the House and the Senate were very, very vague. And the citizen had almost no understanding of the nature of the evidence that was being used. He had no right to make statements. He had no right to cross-examine witnesses that were there. He had, in fact, very few rights at all. One of the things that the Supreme Court was faced with in a series of cases, particularly Watkins versus the United States and uh, Barenblatt versus the United States, uh, there's another case by Rummel versus the United States, was to whether those procedures used by the, Senate, by the House Senate and House committees were proper procedures. And in general, they 
held in, that they were not and forced the House and the Senate to tighten up on their procedures. A terribly important thing. Let me make another observation about those investigations. Uh, Professor Ramsey last week talking, or when was it last week? Last week, talking about the Fifth Amendment and his relationship and understanding of the Fifth Amendment. It was a very interesting history of someone's observation of that. He incidentally mentioned the fact that he had a discussion, a series of discussions with the then dean of the Harvard Law School, Erwin Griswold. Erwin Griswold's little book that he referred to as the last one on this list called The Fifth Amendment Today. It came out about 1955 or 56, and was Griswold's, sustaining Griswold's view that the Fifth Amendment is what he called the bedrock of American constitutional liberties. Others would disagree with singling out that particular provision, the Fifth Amendment provision against self-incrimination. Uh, when you were called before a committee, what rights did you have not to cooperate? Well, it turns out, after all the Supreme Court litigation and so on, that you do not have a right to say, I refuse to answer on the grounds of First Amendment rights. can't say that. Because if, in fact, the investigation is germane to some function of Congress, then you have to respond. Can you refuse to answer on Fifth Amendment rights? Yes, and as Professor Ramsey says you do, but you've got to be very careful. It now turns out that you can answer, say, I refuse to answer that because it's possible self-incrimination. But you've got to answer that from the beginning. Now let me give you a quiz. There was a person, person, yes, yeah, person who was called before a House committee in the summer of 1973. What was going on in the summer of 73 in Washington, Watergate? Okay. This guy was called before a House committee, not a Senate committee, in the summer of 1973. And he was asked to stand up, and he stood up, and they said, give us your name. And he said, I refuse to answer on the ground it may incriminate me. <laughs> well, where do you live? I refuse to answer that. And the whole series of questions. Now, it was because of all this litigation going on for all these years that he knew that he could say that. And his attorneys told him to. Does anyone know, this is a quiz, who that was? G. Gordon Liddy. And Liddy has never talked yet about any part of the Watergate thing. The point was that the House Committee, it, they'd done that to well, G. Gordon Liddy as they did to others, Dalton Trumbo and all those other guys back in 1947. They would have made mincemeat out of it in some form or other. But there's been development of a body of constitutional legal protections here, uh, which are, are, are terribly important. Now, Another thing to keep straight about both McCarthy's investigations and the investigations of everybody else, including Senator Irvin's investigations, is that they do not do anything more than provide information. No matter what happens in those committees, I mean, your reputation may be sullied in some form or other, depending upon the nature of the questions and the nature of your answer and the context within which that all occurs. But legally, there's nothing that's happened to you. You are, you know, you are not convicted of anything until, in fact, you have been convicted in a court of law for violating a specifically stated statute. Therefore, one can draw no conclusions legally from what goes on before a congressional committee. Yes. Testimony before a congressional committee uses evidence in a court of law. Can testimony before a congressional committee be used as evidence? Yes, it can. Well, then, then why is the person not safeguarded within the congressional committee? So, uh, since what he says <coughs> later. It can be used later, and if he doesn't claim the Fifth Amendment, then of course it will be used later. If, in fact, he is indicted for violation of some other, from some offense. I'm not quite sure we're on the same... Well, the reason why I was asking is because like, during McCarthy, it seems to me that certain people were convicted of, um, what is it, uh, contempt of, uh -huh. okay. of the contempt. Yeah, that's right. Uh, let me use an example. I mentioned a case called Barenblatt versus the United States. Lloyd Barenblatt happened to be a guy I know. I knew. Uh, Lloyd was a graduate student at Michigan in the late 40s. And Maybe MIT had them, I don't know. Tony, you were around, I don't know if you were here then. Uh, every college campus in the country had 
most theory, had Marxist study groups. Now, Marx is a major philosopher. He's a major intellect in our world, and uh, Marxist study groups can exist for a variety of reasons. Among other things, the House Un-American Activities Committee had a whole series of hearings on the influence of communism in education. And therefore, they went to various campuses, and they call up Murray Biggs and Dan Haber and get them in there. Now, we understand that you uh, uh, attended meetings of the Marxist study group. And they'd say, what about that, Mr. Biggs? And Mr. Biggs would say, I refuse to answer. It's none of your business, what I do. It's a free country, freedom of speech, First Amendment, whatever. And the committee, not liking your response, would say, ah, what about that? You're in contempt. They'd vote a contempt charge. And the contempt charge then would go to the full house. And the full house in those days always supported the committee. Yes, right, contempt. And he would be in contempt of Congress. Now, it's they, in fact, are not a court of law, although what they find there can be used, you see, okay, as evidence. On the other hand, it's an evidence which leads to an indictment, but then the indictment has got to, to be success successfully prosecuted. It's got to have a lot of other evidence as well. All right. Let me conclude by asking a question, and then see if I can respond to it. Here we are in 1976. What we've been describing occurred in its form back in 1946 to 54. In its form. Its form at that time was a public inquiry into the nature of individual behavior and belief. That inquiry was carried on by state legislatures by individual colleges, by Senator McCarthy, by congressional committees. And its attempt was to alert the public and perhaps to do a variety of other mean and not so mean political things. And the atmosphere of the country was quite right for receiving that. So in 1976, what form does that set of activities take? My suggestion to you is that the form, in some senses, is quite different, but that the substance is in very much the same. What we have now been learning through the activities of Senator Church's investigations into the investigative agencies suggests that what Senator McCarthy and Congressman Nixon were doing publicly and using congressional machinery <coughs> was done not publicly and using investigative machinery of the various investigative agencies and engaging in, and this is my language, I will stand by it, harassment of citizens through mail openings, through observation, through mugging, through taking of uh, movies, films, and so on, of innocent citizens. Uh, and that what you found here, and this is a point I want to make, is an institutionalization of a set of attitudes which we have been almost, which made it almost impossible for us to locate. And it's only through the Watergate and subsequent activities that we'd be able to see the dimension of the institutionalization of these attitudes. An institutionalization which, unfortunately, was occurred as a function of the Cold War but receive congressional, continued congressional support through continued congressional authorization and through congress, lack of continued congressional oversight. Now, specifically, as I said earlier, congressional procedures have been improved markedly. We now have a series of civil liberties cases which provide some kinds of protections for individuals. The Supreme Court has ruled unconstitutional certain other aspects of the things that Congress tried to do. But there are many things still on the statute books of minor character. Uh, but we do have this vast investigative bureaucracy, which has now been engaged in a series of investigations and inquiries at a secret level, somewhat like was carried on at a public level earlier. Uh, the universities now are not the subject of that kind of inquiry. There is one thing I want to say, though, 
uh, finally, which we have now, which we didn't have in the middle 50s. I think that as a result of the civil rights movement and the civil rights agitation, the urban crises of the 60s, the anti-war movement, and now the revelations of Watergate and so on, there are many people professionally involved who are actively working to open up the investigative agencies and are working to try to get Congress to not pass legislation which is repressive and to amend legislation or to rescind legislation that in fact is repressive or does violate First Amendment or other individual rights. The city of Washington is honeycombed with a raider, nader raider type civil liberties groups which are in fact actively engaged in a whole series of litigation in courts and in presentation of testimony before committees of Congress. That countervailing power we didn't have going on in the 50s. It's a funny thing. The 50s led to what Thornton Wilder once characterized the Yale undergraduates in the mid-50s as being the silent generation. And they were. I was working with students, and boy, they would, wouldn't take a chance on anything because they were afraid. And it was a great refreshing thing to find students and other people in the late 60s willing to take a chance on almost any idea. I ask students now as to whether we're back with the silent generation again or whether the silence, if that's what it is, is a function of other things. Uh, I'll go back to my first point. McCarthyism was not an aberration. It takes many forms and is continually with us. Okay, that's all I have to say. I'd be glad to be responsive. Yeah, why don't we I didn't say answer, I said responsive. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, responses. Yes, yeah, sir. Do you see the government prosecution of, end of major anti war figures with conspiracy trials? Uh, as a generalization of this harassment and a more public form of it by the executive agency, for instance, and, and as a success from that perspective, even if there's a failure in convicting the person of anything. Uh, yes, I, I agree that the conspiracy uh, charges which were brought against the Harrisburg 10 and the Pittsburgh 8 and the somebody rather 12 and so on and so on, were in fact an attempt to use conspiracy theory, which is now in very cloudy uh, development, conspiracy doctrines to get at citizens, and I think that they were successful in getting the indictments uh, and in bringing the cases, uh, but the indictments were based upon, in many instances, either perjured testimony by, F by FBI informers or by testimony that was shot down by very capable lawyers in court, so that in fact the net result was the same though. These people were harassed. They had to use all of their meager resources to defend themselves in court, and it deflected the movement. Conspiracy did deflect the movement. There's a marvelous piece by Frank Donner, who was one of the major attorneys for the American Civil Liberties Union, on this question of conspiracy uh, charges as a mode of political uh, uh, political repression. There's an excellent couple of articles in The Nation magazine about two years ago. And if anybody wants to pursue that, I would suggest they do that. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Tim? On the uh, institutionalization and persistence of these certain types of attitudes about loyalty, could you comment on the, <clears throat> the movement of the, of the harassment proceedings into grand jury settings, where you know, I understood in the last three to five years, during some of these same conspiracy trials, they developed a technique wherein you couldn't even use the fifth to protect yourself. Uh, if you recall before a grand jury, since the proceedings were yep. for the secrets on it. Okay, that's a very good question. Grand juries, grand juries are without doubt one of the most powerful legal instruments we have in this country. And if you ever get on a grand jury, don't forget that. Uh, uh, a grand jury is made up of 23 citizens who are brought together to hear evidence usually presented by a prosecutor, out of which then comes an indictment. An indictment is merely a statement that there is sufficient evidence to warrant a trial. 
An indictment is no sense a legal finding of any kind other than a formal statement by a group, group of 23 of your peers to say that in fact there is sufficient evidence. Now a grand jury normally is led by the nose in the sense it's impaneled by a judge at the request of a prosecuting attorney, district attorney, and the district attorney brings to the grand jury the information that he wants to bring. And he wants to uh, find an indictment against you because you're raising questions about conspiracy theories, you know, and then so on and so on and so on. So they dig up a lot of background. The grand jury itself can tell the prosecutor to get lost, sir. Or you go out and you bring in da 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 da. They can, in fact, direct the investigation themselves. They almost rarely do that. They don't know they have that power. And uh, nobody ever tells them. Uh, but they do. Now, what happens in a grand jury is that you're called before a grand jury and you're asked a bunch of questions and you can plead the Fifth Amendment or not. There was a man here, who not here, he was here in Cambridge, he was on the Harvard faculty, got his PhD in the Department of Political Science at MIT, called before a grand jury in Boston in the summer of 1971 and they said, Mr. Popkin, sir, uh, did you know Mr. Ellsberg? Yes. Uh, could you tell us anything you may know about these papers that he's made public? Well, I refuse to answer that question. Oh, well, you can't, you can't refuse to answer the question. Well, I do refuse to answer the question. I'm a scholar, said Mr. Popkin, political scientist. I guess they're scholars. And he <laughs> said, he said uh, oh, well, that, uh, that, that, uh, that violates my First Amendment rights to have to answer that question. And the uh, judge there was much agitation about this, and under rules, if you refuse to cooperate with a grand jury, you can be put in the pokey, and you stay there until one of two things happens. You purge yourself by answering the question, or the grand jury finally expires. That is, after however long it's been impaneled, and some grand juries are impaneled up to 18 months. So you can spend some considerable time in the pokey. Uh, Mr. Popkin went to the pokey, and uh, he was an employee of Veritas, uh, Harvard University, uh, and uh, <laughs> the, uh, the president of Harvard University was the former dean of the Harvard Law School, Derek Bach, and the political science department here and other scholars in greater Boston area around the country were quite agitated that one of their colleagues was in jail for refusal to answer questions about his information about the Pentagon Papers. Um, just to make a long story short, President Bach worked out an arrangement with the Justice Department in Washington. I guess the old boy network uh, functioned in some way or other. At any rate, Popkin was let loose, and they forgot the question, and eventually the grand jury went out of business. They never brought any indictments. So. Now, my reason for going into this is that Popkin could not answer on that ground. It's like the First Amendment issue in the, in the Congress, sir. He had, he, if he chose the Fifth, he might have been able to get away with it. Certainly, he could not defend himself on the ground that he was a scholar and therefore didn't have to divulge his information. Now, if you use the Fifth Amendment, that doesn't prohibit the prosecutor from going beyond that. There are two immunity statutes which have been passed. One was passed in 1954, at the height of all of this McCarthy business, as a way of getting around your use of the Fifth Amendment. And what it is, it's called use immunity. And under use immunity, if you testify to something in a grand jury proceeding or a congressional committee or a court of law, whatever you testify to cannot be used against you. Therefore, you have to answer because you cannot be incriminate yourself. That is, you cannot be tried or charged with something to which you have addressed yourself as a result of enforced testimony. Others can. Others can. That information can be used elsewhere. Uh, now, what has happened in, what happened in grand jury proceedings, and again there's an excellent article, again by Frank Donner, <laughs> on this same issue, is that the Justice Department in the Mitchell uh, years would impanel a grand jury, let's say, in Bridgeport, Connecticut, or someplace, a federal grand jury, and ask a series of questions there. They would get information which they would feed back to the Justice Department, which was illegal then that information would form the basis of a series of questions before a grand jury, let's say, in Arizona. So what the grand jury was used for was it used as a way of getting further information which was compelled testimony. 
Right. Now, that's a stopped, but there's nothing to prohibit it from continuing. Because as far as I know, Tim, there's no litigation on that subject. Right. Just along that line, what's the constitutional basis for having grand jury? I mean, what, uh, how can they not have the rule of evidence for the constitutional protection? Well, the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution provides that you that be, uh, you have to be, the, no criminal charge can be issued unless on presentment or indictment by a grand jury. Therefore, a grand jury, for any criminal offense at the federal level, grand jury must be impaneled and must reach a conclusion, a verdict. That's not your question, is it? No. What is the your nature, question? The, the nature, nature of the grand jury. Where is that? Where was that? Is the president established? Oh, grand jury? Oh, grand jury! The grand jury comes out of uh, early uh, Plantagenet uh, history, largely under Henry the uh, Second. Under Henry the uh, Second, in the oh, late eleven seventies, eleven eighties, uh, he began the process of drawing together uh, people to say, "What is the nature of this charge?" And people would come together and they'd say, "Well, it looks like this," and then there'd be a prosecution, or the person would be brought to court. And it was the very first evidence, historically, the grand jury goes way, way, way back to the 12th century. And the, the, the grand jury procedures and provisions and so on have matured ever since then. Uh, now, I said before that nobody really knows who serves on a grand jury what their rights are. They are given a statement and so on. It's, I was unfair since they are given a statement as to what a grand jury can do. But rarely does a grand jury have on it people who are able to exert independence. One of the most interesting grand juries we've had uh, to surface was the Watergate grand jury. The Watergate grand jury had a foreman, and you may remember him. His name was Mr. Pragel. Mr. Pragel was, I think, uh, he's a naturalized American citizen. Very interesting. Naturalized American citizen who was very concerned over individual rights. Uh, and he was the foreman for the grand jury. Uh, he was, I think, a either Bulgarian or Yugoslav who had come to this country. He was employed in the Library of Congress, incidentally, and it was Mr. Pregal who uh, was quite concerned and furious, as a matter of fact, that Leon Jaworski ruled automatically that that grand jury could not indict Richard Nixon. Uh, okay, uh, that's a long-winded answer. Other observations, comments? Yes? Were the detective caps ever used? For that purpose, no. Uh, they were in place and they were maintained. They may have been used them for flood victims nobody, or something. Nobody was ever detained. Them. No. Those provisions were never invoked by any president. Uh, let me just say that, I, as I said, if the president declared a state of national emergency and made certain findings, then those provisions could go into f force and effect. Uh, they were gone, you said. They could, back then. Uh -oh. yeah, okay. Let me just, my point was that there are now in the statute books. 473 statutes which provide the president with the authority to declare a national emergency and under that total collection he can be a, a total tyrant in reality. Uh, Senator Church and Senator Mathias have done a major study of this and there's legislation now in both houses of Congress to try to make some sense out of all this emergency legislation. Do you see Senator <laughs> yes, very definitely. That's another lecture. Uh, Senate Bill 1 is that thick. It's 720 pages. S1, as it's called, had a precursor called S1400. S1400 was first supported, submitted to the Senate by uh, Nixon White House, but it was sponsored by Senator Roman Huska of uh, Nebraska. The present uh, bill, S1, which is a cousin to S1400, is supported by, among other people, Senator John McClellan of Arkansas, and until he took his name off the list of sponsors, Senator Birch Bayh of Indiana. Uh, S1 is a, a, it's a compilation, but it would be very simple. It's a major overhaul of Title 18 of the U.S. Code, which is the Criminal Code. Uh, the Criminal Code desperately needs to be overhauled in light of all of the Supreme Court litigation and so on, on citizens' rights, uh, the Miranda rulings, on uh, confessions, and so on, and so on, and so on. The criminal code does need to be overhauled. In the process of overhauling it, there are provisions which have been inserted in S-1400 and now in S-1, which would make it a crime 
to do a whole variety of things. For example, um, we don't have at the moment any law class allowing the classification of government documents. The classifications which government documents have, secret, top secret, and all that, simply have no basis in law. They were determined by the president under executive orders, under some constitutional provision, unnamed. So that when Daniel Ellsberg made the Pentagon Papers public, he was not making public legally secret documents. S1 would make the classification system legal and would provide very severe penalties for violating it. Uh, there are a whole series of sections in there dealing with that. Uh, there are other sections which deal with the rights of newsmen. There are other sections which deal with classifying what is defense information, which practically makes the numbers of Nabisco biscuits they buy a, a matter of defense information, the publication of which would be uh, criminal. Uh, now, S-1 is had hearings in the Senate. It's going to be marked up by the committee. That is, the committee is going to start sitting in February, going it over line by line and page by page, all 700 pages of it. The Senate Judiciary Committee is marking it up. There has been a companion measure submitted in the House by Congressman Kastenmeier of uh, Wisconsin and Congressman think, Edwards of California which is a codification of the criminal statute, but without all of these other provisions in. And we, I don't know how we're going to make out on this. It's, it's a possibility that now that the anti-war movement is over, and we are in a silent period, that this piece of legislation might somehow muster support in, either, in both houses. And then that depends on who sits down at the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue and signs it or doesn't sign it. Yeah. So, Picking up on uh, your comments before that some of this being fairly old pastor in history, I think we have a strain of populism that uh, goes back before Sam Adams. And as far as the government getting involved in suppression, we go back to the first alien sedition after the Adams administration. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that strikes me as President McCarthy era, as opposed to, say, the later uh, Vietnam era, is that you had a case where both government and popular attitudes were, were going the same way, uh, and thus the government and the anti-communist measures were receiving rather widespread public support, was, uh, whereas in the 60s, uh, there was more of a... There's a tension. There was a tension, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, which meant that people who were in opposition I think that's. I think you're right. Uh, that's a very interesting observation, and you'd almost make a generalization about it in the sense that where there is openness and discussion, and hence the possibility for tension, you get much sharper public policy coming forward, and perhaps less damaging public policy in the long run. Uh, there's a very interesting example of this. Uh, let me use this. It it's doesn't deal with the public, it deals with private. There's a marvelous story about the Vietnam War, which it turns out is a true story. It was in 1954, spring of 1954, the North Vietnamese, or the Viet Minh as they were then known, were about to beat the living daylights out of the French. And the question in the United States was, in as much as the United States, and this was not public information then, it is now, was supporting the French colonial effort to 80% of the cost in 1954. Why didn't we send American troops? And the then Vice President of the United States, Richard Nixon, gave a speech before the National Press Club in April of 1954 in which he suggested we send American troops. Uh, the French had arrived in Washington and had requested this American, direct American support and President Eisenhower had asked the Chiefs of Staff to do a study of what this would be like. And Admiral Radford, who was then the Chief of Staff, made a recommendation that in fact we send five billion troops and so on and so on to Indochina. And he presented this to the President and to the then Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, 
and the evidence is that Dulles supported the Radford recommendation. President Eisenhower was unsatisfied in some way or other, and he called a meeting to be held at the State Department, which he did not attend. But uh, uh, with Admiral Radford, Secretary Dulles, and the eight, made eight uh, leaders of Congress, uh, including the then majority, minority leader, minority leader of the United States Senate, because they were in the minority, Lyndon Johnson. And he presented the Radford recommendations to this group, and he wanted their advice. And they said, in no way do we want to get involved. First of all, there's no legal justification for doing this. We were involved in Korea because the United Nations sort of kind of mandated what we were involved with there. There's no legal justification, no way. Eisenhower bought their recommendation, and of course we didn't go into Vietnam or Indochina in 1954. Uh, and you could say, well, that's very good, because what you had there were two different points of view coming together to make a this policy. The decision to bomb Cambodia <laughs> had one point of view. Now, I think the same thing obtains in the public. You, know, you get tension. That's why I think we, these Nader Raider type groups that I mentioned in Washington are terribly helpful because they keep open the channels of information. I think, you know, I don't know, I won't go on beyond that. Your point is well taken. Yes, sure. Well, just getting back to what you said, even with these uh, Nader Raider groups, secret bombing in Cambodia did occur. And I would prefer not to have to rely on such a thing. but we rely on something in the law to keep this thing open. Okay, all right. What would you do? It's... I don't know, it's a very, very complicated yeah, well, yeah. field. And I, all I'm suggesting is that there has to be there has to be some channel open whereby some such secret warfare, expensive warfare is not even counting money and lives and whatever cannot occur without people doing yeah. Well I think that this is at the heart of whatever recommendations the church committee is going to come up with. And they may not be very dramatic uh, recommendations. Yeah. What you have to do is to say institutionalize at, at an open level things where you, rather than have to rely on the good fortune that Stuart Mott is going to fund somebody uh, to run a, uh, a public interest organization. That's right. I can give you an example of that. When the assassination thing all came up last year, Senator Church's position was, well, there's no law in the United States which makes it illegal to assassinate a foreign leader. You see. Now, he said, I think what we ought to do is to have laws on these subjects. So when the president says to uh, Mr. Colby, uh, go bump off somebody, Mr. Colby said, but Mr. President, it's against the law. You wouldn't want to have me violate the law, would you? <laughs> well, uh, yeah. okay. They, they would do it anyway. Yeah. Uh, they might do it anyway. Then what do you do that if they do it, quote, do it anyway? Well, I personally stand for doing away with all these and restructuring totally if it must happen. I mean, if you must have the CIA. Yeah, you know, right. Well, I think that this is a crucial question you've raised, which is going to be facing us over the next months. It has come up now in the last 18 months, and it's going to be a major issue. Uh, whether it's going to get resolved in this presidential year is another question. Incidentally, Lou, could you hear me during the course of all this? Okay. Uh, S1 in the addition to a case like five and seven sets up a balance checks. Uh, for example, Colby said was brought up on um, charges and uh, well, this rotten thing that's coming off the board. He say, well, I believe it's going to be international security and that would be a balance check. So then, yeah. yeah. That's right. That's right. His belief. That's right. That's right. If the things, if you are, if if you are, yes, if you can demonstrate that you believed such and such to be the case when you took that action, that's justification. Exactly, sir. Well, well, I would you know, sort of annoy, uh, well, more than annoy, I just actually very upset with a recent poll taken by NBC News, in which um, NBC asked the following question said. Um, in cases of national security, which they didn't define, they just said in cases of national security, which of the following 
if any, would you justify? They said wiretapping, entering homes, and reading mail. 49% of the American public said nothing, which was, which was you know, not nearly enough. And 51% of the people justified some of the following. By far, the largest justification was for wiretapping. Um, the least was for mail. And, no, excuse me, there was like very close um, reading mail and entering home. I think 12 and 11 percent of people said that that would be justified. And, and I was shocked that, you know, 51 percent, I mean, excuse me, that, you know, 51 percent of the American public mm -hmm. would justify. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I think. Well, I think that this gets to the point that was made here a moment ago about, about the social context within which these things are done. One of the interesting if you think back historically, our tendency, incidentally, at MIT, if I may make a comment, is not to think historically. Uh, I think we ought to think more historically than not. Just to use an example, you Alien Sedition Acts, if you go back to the period before the revolution, uh, the issues about individual privacy, the sanctity of the home, the whole question of writs of assistance relative to searches and seizures and so on, were on the minds of many, many people, and there were documents, the famous Cato letters, which had been written in England from 1720 to 1723, had wide circulation up and down the Atlantic seaboard. And these things were discussed frequently and openly. And though Lord knows there's plenty of discussion about these things now, I'm not quite sure of the way in which it gets through to the body politic. And maybe it's a discussion which doesn't occur in the right context to heighten consciousness of some of these things. Uh, and public opinion is a fickle thing on which to rest uh, one's hopes or one's despairs. Uh, for, let me give you the only poll I've seen which gives me any hope about anything is that 80% of the people, according to this poll, I forgot the Harris poll or somebody, think that we are uh, profligate in our use of our natural resources and we shouldn't do that. Well, I find that to be helpful, to sustain me at night when I try to get to sleep. Uh, but I need more than that when I get up in the morning and look at the times about strip mining or whatever. So this reminds me of Earl Warren's famous remark some years in the middle of late 50s. And he said that, I guess it was when he was governor of California, he passed, he, this is an old social science survey thing. And he referred to it, though, publicly. You give people a copy of the American Declaration of Independence and say, do you agree with this? Well, you know, 90% say, oh, my God, that's revolutionary. Of course I don't agree with it. And he, you know, Earl Warren said, cluck, cluck, isn't that terrible? On the other hand, then he proceeded to lead a court, which proceeded to expand the provisions of the uh, Bill of Rights markedly. Yeah. Ted, I don't want to take up any more time with anybody. Uh, why don't we break up now, and then we can, anybody who else has any follow-up questions? Yeah, good. I was ready to ask one of my own. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to hide. You know, one of the things that strikes me about the telephone is in terms of personal opinion, when you're preparing the legal structure and personal opinion, I mean, for example, you have the executive uh, privilege. I'm looking back at the uh, 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 Terrific. Don't let them have that. Don't have that. And the same ruling, the same, the same, uh, uh, the I mean, when Nixon was in the same. See that? He's dead. He's very aggressive. I heard this from a week ago. This kind of thing, even in myself, was so important, even with this, you know, certain legal structure within which, uh, uh, which legal structure, was was the the depending on public attitude, the thing can be used, misused, or used in any kind of production.